We're here to really promote and see our past and present years and how they are changing the narrative. Um, moving on to our agenda, I would um, uh, we're going to have Kadim take us through the land acknowledgments, just as we set the pace for today's conversation. So, um, Kadim, please, uh, we'd love that we uh, recognize our land and territory right now, from upon which we are um, having this conversation right now. Thank you. Absolutely. Honoring the land and territory, Halton as we know it today, is rich in history and modern traditions, many First Nations and the Métis. From the lands of the Ashinaabe to the Atawandran to the Haudenosaunee and the Métis, these lands surrounding the Great Lakes are steeped in indigenous history. As we gather today on these treaty lands, we are in solidarity with our indigenous brothers and sisters to honor and respect the four directions lands, waters, plants, animals, and ancestors that walked before us, and all the wonderful elements of creation that exist. We acknowledge and thank the Mississauga, the Credit First Nation, for being stewards of this traditional territory. Thank you so much. Um, so that would officially uh, let us kick into our um, conversation for today. And with our opening remark, we're gonna have our BMI founder and executive director, um, Evangeline Chimer, who is a mother and a wife, a wonderful founder of this great initiative and a great organization and executive director. And her dream has always been to see black people represented in leadership positions, being treated fairly in society and, all, and also in the community. But above all, like she's, just been so amazing in elevating our voices and also ensuring that both our personal and professional pursuits are attained. And let's just give a round of applause to her empowering um, Evangeline Chima. She's always going to be smiling anyways. So <laughs> just see that smile that brightens up the day. Welcome, Evangeline. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Chaiwo. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us for the Blue and Black Conversation Session. And by the way, happy Black History Month. I'm so glad that you can be with us this evening. Three years ago, I created Black Mentorship Inc, BMI, to address the persistent mentorship gap Black professionals and youths in their early and mid-career levels face. And to ensure that all people, like Taiwo said, reach their full potential. Today, we work hard. Everybody here, um, Taiwo, Hedim, uh, David, uh, so many of our volunteers and our board directors, we all work hard to unleash the power of communities working together to solve problems for Blacks, Indigenous, and people of color with the hope of improving police experience and real life outcomes for everyone. As an organization dedicated to empowering black professionals in Canada, we believe communities are at the focus point of change. Therefore, we have these encouraging, sometimes difficult conversations to enforce the importance of working together to achieve the transformation in policy and in other aspects that we seek. Building a better, more equitable world requires all of us to join hands in fostering community innovations. And really, I thank the brave men and women from the halting police region joining us here today for this critical, important conversation. I also thank our community change makers, Lola Ademi and my son, David Chima, for their relentless support in accelerating positive and lasting change through respectful dialogue. Angela Y. Davis said, I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. As individuals, we must all come to terms with our own biases 
and other undesirable descriptions we put on each other day in, day out to establish unfailing transformation that ensures everyone, irrespective of your race, feels they belong in the community and importantly in professional settings. So once again, thank you everyone here. Shout out to all of our volunteers and everyone that is making the dream, the mission of BMI come to fruitful. Thank you. Thank you for that, Miss Evangeline. Thank you for that. Um, and let me say thank you to you because you're saying thank you to all of us. Thank you right back to you for putting all this together for us and taking that step out three years ago. All right, so I'd like to give it up to you as well. Now, um, I'm gonna be introducing Chief Tanner. And Chief Tanner was, was born in Oakville, Oakville, Ontario, entering the policing profession as a member of the Halton Regional Police Service in 1982. Since 1998, Chief Tanner has held several senior leadership positions in the police force. He became Canada's youngest chief of police at the age of 41. Chief Tanner's heart lies with Halton and he is grateful for the opportunity to serve the residents of this great community. Okay, so let me go ahead and share this screen here for you so we can go ahead and hear from Chief Tanner. Hello, and thank you for inviting us to participate in your Black History Month event. Black History Month is an opportunity for us all to recognize and honor the enormous contributions that the Black community have made here in Canada and far beyond. Our partnerships with the many organizations across Halton, including yours, help to ensure that the policing services we deliver truly meet the needs of those we serve. You help us to achieve our goals, not only through your support, but by identifying areas where we can and must be better. For this, I thank you. Throughout the month of February, our service will participate in a number of Black History Month events and celebrations across the region. These events will provide our members with the opportunity to learn about the rich culture, history and resilience that make the Black community here in Halton so very special. This learning is part of our ongoing personal and professional commitment to do and to be better. On behalf of the nearly 1,200 members of the Halton Regional Police Service, including myself, our two deputies, and our senior leadership team, thank you for all you do, not only as you celebrate and honor Black heritage this month, but every day of the year. Thank you so much, um, Chief Turner. We, we know you're not able to make it here today, but we do appreciate the video that um, acknowledges the Black History Month celebration. Um, and we also do appreciate that we have the Halton Regional Police Service um, um, represented on here for today's um, conversation. Um, moving ahead of that, I'm going to be introducing um, one of our panelists on here. Um, it's who's also part of the Halton Regional Police Service. Um, going by the name Sergeant Ryan Smith. is um, also part of the Halton Regional Police um, Service under the Equity, um, Diversity and Inclusion. And Sam Ryan Smith began policing career in 2010 of May, where he was assigned to uniform patrol in the town of Oakville. And in 2014, he began investigative role within the Drug and Human Trafficking Unit. And during this time at the, um, at the Human Trafficking Unit, um, he developed a strong passion for supporting victims of crime through a prevention and a risk mitigation model. Ryan later transferred to the Regional Community Mobilization Bureau, where he oversaw and developed several programs and initiatives designed to support um, the diverse community that we have here in Halton, living in, in, in this region. Ryan later transferred from the Regional Community Police. Um, sorry, in 2019, he was promoted to the rank of Sergeant, where he spent time in various roles 
including patrol and a supervisor in the local criminal investigative bureau. And in June 2020, uh, Ryan was reassigned to the Regional Community Mobilization Bureau, where he is now at the Police Service Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Coordinator. Ryan does understand the importance of community partnership and is committed to enhancing community safety and well-being through outreach and collaboration. We welcome you so much, Ryan, to um, this being a, one of our panelists, and we thank you for the continued support that you've always um, had with um, BMI and just the Halton, the diverse um, community that we have in Halton. Thank you. So our, one of our other panelists I'll be introducing, um, Constable Aaron Cormier. Uh, Constable Aaron Cormier joined the Halton Regional Police Service in the year 2000. Over the course of her career, she has had the privilege of the privilege of working uniform patrol in all of the districts as a patrol officer. She was a first responder for sexual offenses, a scene of crime officer, and a proud coach officer. In 2017, Aaron joined the recruiting unit where she developed a new passion for recruiting the, on, recruiting the onboarding and professional development of our members. In this role, Aaron has placed an emphasis on identifying and attracting, attracting diverse talent to the police service, often working with community stakeholders to support this important work. She recently joined the services equity, diversity and inclusion unit, where she hopes to leverage her recruiting experience and passion to promote a safe, equitable and inclusive workforce, workplace and community. So Aaron, we also like to thank you for being here and for being one of our panelists today. Thank you, welcome Aaron. Um, so we're just ongoing presenting our panelists for today. So you have a robust idea of who and where they're coming from. I'm pleased to also invite on here, um, Constable Jazz Mass James, AKA BJ. Um, not the DJ that you get the music, just for short. <laughs> Good to have you. Um, so DJ in 2014, in 2018, before policing, Constable DJ had graduated from George Brown College, receiving a college diploma from the Community Worker Program. And DJ then transferred to Agoma University in um, South Murray, where he earned a bachelor's degree graduating from the Community Economic and Social Development Program in June 2020. His final capstone research paper titled, The Qualitative Impact of Gun Violence in Lawrence Heights, ignited his passion for advocacy work in his home community, Lawrence Heights. And then on September 2022-2020, um, DJ, along with several grassroots community organizations and local politicians, spearheaded a safety walk to bring awareness to the gun violence plague in their area. The monument from the safety walk snowballed and residents from the community were invited to several safety meetings where the Toronto community housing, Toronto police, politicians and other safety leaders were in attendance to listen and support the ideas and initiative residents shared to enhance the safety of the Lawrence Heights. And so throughout his time in university and the community, it was just during the stretch of DJ's life where he decided that he wanted to become a police officer, which, is he, which he is right now today. And um, DJ had embarked on his policing journey in August, 2021, and is currently assigned to uniform patrol in the town of Oakville. And DJ understands the importance of youth engagement and community safety, um, and also community mo mo mobilization and fostering positive relationship. We do welcome you on here, DJ. Thank you for um, being a part of today's conversation. Thank you. Next, we would like to introduce Lola, Lola Adeyemi. Uh, Lola is a management consultant, trainer, professional speaker, and a mission-driven entrepreneur with a passion for inclusivity and innovation. She is a strategic leader who believes in aligning the needs of customers, employees, and businesses to meet business goals. Her role at Olade Consulting involves recruiting and retention, business development, partner vendor management, and people development, providing leadership to the teams and support, supporting a network of consultants working with diverse clients across Canada. Prior to joining the Olade executive team, she worked as an IT consultant 
with some of Canada's big five banks and was a transformation consultant with the city of Toronto, implementing enterprise-wide technology and infrastructure projects to meet the strategic innovation needs of Canada's most populated city. Her mission is to be a catalyst for growth and expansion of Olade Consulting by staying committed and aligned to the overall mission, which is to empower clients to achieve their set goals. Uh, Lola, we'd like to thank you as well for being here, definitely, and we look forward to your input as well. Thanks for having me. Welcome, Lola. And um, last but not the least, we have a wonderful David Chima, who is also the BMI program assistant. He's very much involved with what BMI does, and I do appreciate that he also is part of this conversation, kind of representing the youth, you know, having that conversation. Um, a little about David. Um, David, who is also the son of Benjamin Chima, our ED, is a fourth year student at the Toronto Metropolitan University, formerly known as the Ryerson University. He's, he's studying um, business technology management and also wants um, to be an aspiring um, lawyer. He's also an artist, which led him to become an entrepreneur, starting his own business at age 17. His business allowed him to leverage his artistic abilities to create custom apparel for his, for his clients. And his business has accumulated 30,000 K plus followers across all social media pages with various um, videos reaching over 1 million views. David has translated his success on social media to hundreds of product sales, all while still in school. Isn't that amazing? He also works at um, Black Mentorship Inc. as the program assistant and is dedicated to enhancing Black professionals through mentorship and inspiring youth through his business ventures. Welcome, David, to this conversation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, um, my name is Kadeem McLean. Again, I'm, I'm a volunteer with uh, BMI, Black Mentorship Inc. And I'll be having the pleasure of moderating this panel with, of course, our BMI Board of Secretary, Taiwo Allende. Great, thank you. So um, I guess we're all set for um, the panel discussion. And we do have people on here right now. So. Um, So I, I don't know if anyone wants to give a brief introduction about themselves. We've done a lot talking about your bio and history. If you just want to um, give a brief introduction, Sergeant Ryan. Uh, sure, yeah, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome. Yeah, no, thank you very much. And I appreciate you reading our bios and, and appreciate more having us here. Uh, you know, I've had the opportunity to work with BMI for close to the past three years and have been, have been involved in every one of these conversations uh, and know how critically important it is for our members to be involved in these conversations. So um, I'm looking forward to this evening uh, and answering any questions uh, that you, know, uh, you have or those in attendance have. And again, I wanna echo the chief's comments that on behalf of the police service, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And we really appreciate your partnership. And uh, as I often say to Evangeline, your friendship, she started to become family. Uh, so uh, thank you on behalf of the team and myself. So thank you so much for coming. Um, I, I'll just move on to Erin, if you just want to give a, a brief. Um, Uh, hello, everybody, and uh, I'll just echo what Ryan said. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having us. Uh, I'm honored to be here to uh, maybe you know share some um, insight and um, some of my own experiences. Uh, I come from a recruiting background, um, obviously uniform patrol, but in the most recent years, uh, recruiting background where I've become passionate about uh, making sure we attract diverse talent um, that's representative of our, our entire diverse community. So. I'm very fortunate to be here, uh, very honored and uh, really excited to be a part of this. So thanks very much for having me. Thank you. It's exciting to hear what you have to say today. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'll just move on to DJ. Yeah, no, thank you so much for having me here. I'm happy to be here to have this conversation. I think it's going to be a very great one. I know it's going to be a very great one and an important one as well, um, especially, you know, being a Black officer and coming from the Black community and also um, growing up in Lawrence Heights and experiencing 
um, many issues that people from those type of communities uh, experience, whether it's running into the law or being pulled over or just going down that wrong path in life. I feel like I can relate to those people. So hopefully my words could touch wherever it is it's supposed to touch and it actually holds some meaning to them. So happy to be here and share my insight and share my experience. Certainly, and we're looking forward to hearing experiences. Um, you do have um, very vibrant, so that would be great to hear. Um, moving on to Lola, um, thanks for showing up today. Um, if you can just give us a remark. Um, can everyone hear me? Can you hear me clearly? Okay. Yeah, so thanks for having me today. Um, you know, I, um, as mentioned in my bio, I work predominantly in tech, but the focus a lot of times is on BIPOC employment and empowering uh, immigrants and people within the Black community and also other uh, racialized minorities uh, to get in, um, employed, get empowered, and get culturally um, um, settled within, you know, this new world, this new environment, or even sometimes um, like David, who is a second generation Canadian, um, you know, he has also the carryover of some of the experiences that um, his parents may have had as first generation, either with interaction with the police or even just interaction in Canada in general. And so that carryover of sometimes traumatic experiences can affect the relationship and interactions. So, and that comes into different places, even in the workplace. So um, I'm happy to and excited to give my perspective um, as well. Thank you so much. And I know you're doing a lot of um, work in the, um, in the community, especially with your product and also um, empowering this youth. So we really yes. want to hear about what you, um, how we can do better and how we can keep being an ally to each other. Thank you. And um, I'll move on to David. Um, if you have like, just, you know, just tell yourself, I, I do appreciate that you're coming in with a fresh new perspective. So we wanna see what that looks like for you. Thank you so much. Uh, again, I'm so happy to speak with all of you. I'm so happy for everybody is watching. I know I'm much younger than most of the panelists, but you know, as a black youth, uh, young adult, I hope that comes with a unique perspective that will be useful in this conversation. So. I'm happy to speak with all of you and thank you all for coming. Thank you, thank you. We can't wait to hear what you have to say. Awesome, so I'll just do a quick um, housekeeping um, for anyone that had missed earlier today. Um, this session is actually being recorded. So just so you're aware and um, we'll have an opportunity for um, a Q and A later in the end. So if you have any questions that you might wanna ask the panelists, um, please um, use the option of the Q&A or just wait to the end where, where, we, we, where we can actually have that um, conversation together. So um, I'll go right into it just as we have here for this great conversation. So I'd like to start off with um, Ryan Smith. So um, the question I have for you is, um, you know, being a black parent, I myself being a black parent, one of the fears that we have is um, our sons, being pulled by over the police. Um, so like in order to prepare our kids and we have conversations like popularly known as talk, we talk to them, which is kind of intentionally preparing them, our kids to, which is our male child in this, this situation, to know what to do when they're being pulled over. And this is really about overcoming the fear, training them and having them, giving them that idea of how to respond to situations like this. So this conversation is meant to protect them. It's also meant to instill values, instill um, any form of instill the, the fear in the children, you know, have them been empowered. Uh, we have youths in the audience um, participating here today who may have received a stalk from their, from their parents at some point in their life. Um, what do you have to say to them, especially in a, in a situation where they're actually afraid of the police? How can we stigmatize that um, situation, right? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. And you know, you know, first I'm mindful and it's not lost on me um, that I'm fortunate and privileged enough to not have to have that conversation with my child. Uh, but what I would say uh, is that the need for that talk is a reality uh, for many communities uh, across North America and definitely uh, here uh, in Halton. And 
What I would say is that, you know, somebody who wears this uniform, you know, especially in a supervisory position, it's extremely unfortunate uh, that the actions of some uh, have required the need for parents and families to actually be concerned uh, for their safety when interacting with the police, because that is so counterproductive to uh, what we would hope many of us uh, do when we come to work. We're trying to uphold the feeling of public safety and make people feel that they can call us when they need help. Uh, but that being said, you know, it's, it's something that's not lost on uh, me or our, or, or our team here in Halton. I think, you know, as a policing sector, you know, we have to take responsibility uh, for the erosion of public trust and confidence in the work we do. And that responsibility uh, lies or, you know, lies heavily with the actions uh, or, you know, inactions of our members um, and, you know, how that is perceived uh, by the community or the impact that has on the community. And what I would say is I would acknowledge that, you know, there are systemic issues that have plagued the public safety sector. And to be, to be bold and blunt, there's, uh, you know, we've seen racism by individual officers who have no business wearing the police uniform and, you know, paint the sector uh, or, you know, show the sector in a very negative light. And with that said, uh, we also need to reflect on, you know, the many uh, interactions with members of the community the police have on a daily basis across North America. Uh, most of them, uh, the majority of them are positive or would be perceived as positive. But again, you know, it's the actions of few, um, you know, that can cause such damage and again, the erosion of trust. So. This isn't to say that, you know, uh, we have no work to do, because the reality is one negative interaction is too many. And it's counterproductive to the positive narrative that I know that we here within the Halton Regional Police Service are trying to instill in others. And it's time more than ever that we take the responsibility for the actions of our peers. And by peers, I mean uh, those that are um, wearing the uniform so that we can start changing those conversations in a more positive way. And there's so much work to do, but we're committed to that work. And I, what I'll tell you is that we won't always get it right. That I can guarantee you, but we will learn from the mistakes so that all of those across the region uh, here in Halton feel safe interacting with our members. And really to answer your question of what I would say uh, to those youth um, or parents who are having that talk with that youth, or those youth, my hope is that within those talks, those parents or others in leadership positions, instill in them that we are here to help and serve the community. And it's one of our main functions and is something uh, that as policing professionals, uh, we have to keep in the back of our mind no matter what we do. With that said, and you know, the addition to that talk, we're not there yet. And I recognize those talks need to happen. Uh, but again, my advice would be, you know, is to, you know, try to build within those conversations uh, a trust with the police and a feeling that we are here to help and the majority are. And I can tell you personally and professionally, you know, nobody likes um, bad police officers or cops like police officers because the majority of out here are trying to do good work. Um, so I hope that I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you so much, Ryan. And, and I think that's still a conversation that's ongoing. And I do appreciate that you mentioned, you know, really kind of um, building that trust, you know, and enabling us to be able to have our sons approach without having that fear that's been instilled due to what they see on news and or, or the social media. So yeah, the conversation is still gonna be there. We do our part as parents, but then again, um, there's also, I do, um, appreciate that you've acknowledged that there's still more work to be done in this area. Thank you for responding to that. Yes, to echo that, thank you very much, Ryan, for that. Um, Constable Cormier, a two-part question for you. What role do police regions play in rebuilding their broken trust and relationships? And secondly, um, also to give us public safety that we want, please share with us the action plan that police leaders have outlined for policing in 2023 and beyond? So twofold. Uh, so first, um, I'll speak uh, about the role. Um, 
and sorry, whose responsibility? Uh, ultimately, uh, absolutely, it's our responsibility to build, rebuild that trust and to work very hard and make very deliberate efforts to do that um, as an organization, um, but also as a, um, a profession on the whole. Uh, we're very cognizant that um, some of the challenges that are across the nation um, and, and also uh, globally in, in areas that we have no control over, they do have an impact on us here in Halton. Um, and we're very mindful of that. Um, but we are also mindful to recognize the needs of our community and to address those global issues so that they're um, reflective in our community or, or not an issue in our community. I can't speak on behalf of all of the police services. I'd like to think that uh, certainly the ones in Ontario um, and across uh, Canada uh, are in line with the same objectives, but I know that uh, some services will differ slightly. Um, however, it should be a prior priority for all services. However, I can assure you that in Holton, it absolutely is a priority uh, to build those uh, relationships, to rebuild those relationships, um, to reconnect communities and, and to ensure the safety. Um, so in Holton, it absolutely is a priority. Uh, we recognize that it's our responsibility um, and our leadership team um, in conjunction with the community um, established uh, certainly four priorities uh, for us here in Halton. And I'll share those priorities with you. They're not, uh, although there are four, they don't work in, um, in silos or in isolation. Um, it's not just we, we conquer one, uh, we aim to conquer all and they all build on each other and they work, uh, they work with each other. So sometimes we might be doing one and four, sometimes it might be two and three, but ultimately we hope to always address at least one, if not all four. Uh, those priorities are, uh, one would be building an inclusive workplace. Uh, so that's making sure uh, that we're looking um, at our community needs um, and our community and to try to be reflective um, of, um, of our community within our police service. Um, and that includes that inclusive workplace, uh, our ultimate goal within that um, inclusivity is, is an effort. Uh, it's an action. Um, our goal is uh, for belonging, because once you have belonging, that's a feeling. Um, nobody can feel included, but you can certainly feel belong, like that you belong. Um, so how we do that in Halton, we have a couple different um, initiatives. Uh, not These are not exclusive, but I'll just highlight a few. Uh, our multi-faith support team offers um, you know, support, as it says, to uh, multi-faiths, so different faiths. Um, uh, we also consult uh, with EDI professionals, so uh, recognizing that we're not we're not the experts, um, and we do rely on other people uh, to help us with our initiatives. Uh, we also have internal support networks; those are driven by our members, uh, so collective uh, groups uh, that identify with each other. Uh, currently, we have four. Uh, the internal support networks are our South Asian support network, our Black internal support network, our women's internal support work, and our uh, sorry, support network and our uh, 2S LGBTQ plus internal support work network. And that's recognizing that um, each individual um, group has its own unique um, needs and, and feelings uh, and that we support each other through those. So that's an important piece uh, to help with uh, the first priority of building an inclusive workplace. We also have an organizational wellness portal uh, looking after our internal members and their families' health and wellness. Um, in many different aspects. Um, the second priority would be under professional development. Um, and that's where we look at training um, and uh, how we can better empower our members uh, through knowledge uh, and then to implement that knowledge uh, into training and, and actually action. Uh, so equip our members so that they're able to effectively um, handle or, or um, navigate diverse communities. Uh, we do that through annual training, um, whether it's uh, a highlight seminar or a speaker series, um, as well as we have an EDI team that spreads across our districts. Um, it's people who are passionate about the work in EDI, and we can use them as ambassadors, uh, an extension of our unit, uh, to then disseminate information to the front line and to people that are actually uh, interacting every day with the communities, making sure they're up to speed and, and current and, um, and, and diverse in, the, in their thinking as well. Uh, so that those are a few ways we tackle uh, the second priority. Uh, and then the third is the collaboration and uh, engagement. 
Um, and we do that through cultural awareness, uh, just understanding what communities are representative in our community uh, and our, in our region and making sure that our members are aware um, and have knowledge as to, again, those specific uniqueness of those communities. Uh, we do that again through our EDI speaker series, whether it's lived experiences, uh, or just talking to uh, elders or members of the community that can share experiences. Uh, we also have our youth advisory committee uh, and that's uh, representative of our youth who can share with us their perspectives. Um, as David pointed out, we're not all the youngest here on the panel. Uh, so we do appreciate the perspectives from our youth and wanna hear from them what their needs are. Uh, so that's another thing uh, that we have uh, under collaboration and engagement, as well as an adult, uh, elder adult uh, support and our diversity engagement uh, team and uh, community safety and well-being um, accessibility initiatives. So that's under uh, our third priority. Uh, the last priority is education and outreach. And again, I don't want to say last because uh, that could come in at any time. Um, but that is, again, under educating ourselves as well as educating our community on uh, some of the different global events that might impact us here. So we keep an eye on what's happening globally to make sure it doesn't impact our community. And if it does have an impact on our community, how can we help mitigate that and support our members, not just the members of our service, but the members that are impacted by that global event. Uh, so we also monitor hate crimes. Um, and again, when you look at how all of these work with, in conjunction of each other, these priorities, well, we monitor those hate crimes so that we can look at what is happening within our community and then what training or what uh, other priorities can we add to help, again, um, direct that hate crime or, or hopefully eliminate it um, at, through training or through education or whatever it might be. Um, we also have eSync. Uh, super excited to be able to offer that again this year. It was on hiatus uh, because of the global pandemic, uh, but that is an opportunity for us to share emergency services support networks with newcomers uh, because we recognize that uh, some people aren't familiar with what services are available here, how they differ from their home country, uh, and making sure that they have access to all of the support they need um, as a newcomer to this, this community and also this country. So uh, that's something that is hosted uh, through our service. Um, we also do many presentations through community partners, uh, attend many different community events, um, as well as offer peace program for our youth, um, our uh, Yippee program. Uh, and then we also obviously in education and outreach, I can't, uh, I'd be remiss to not uh, recognize recruiting in that, um, in that making sure that we're attracting diverse talent. Uh, and everything that we do, we try to, again, as I said, interact with those pillars, try to hit all of those priorities, uh, the four priorities, um, so that we can be strategic in our actions, we can be deliberate in our actions, and we can be authentic. Um, but that they're all in tune to not just our members' needs, but our community needs. Awesome. Thank you very much for that response there. You gave us some. Now, just to clarify, and first of all, all the panelists, feel free to jump in on any of these questions and add if you have anything. Um, but those are things that are currently being done, if I'm not mistaken, the priorities that are currently the focus. So I don't know if um, either Ryan, DJ, or if you want to continue, Aaron, um, for 2023 and beyond, are there any extra plans for to add anything new? or we're focusing on that for now? Yeah, no, I, I mean, that's an ongoing focus, obviously, and thank you, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, a lot of those initiatives, uh, we, we start them, uh, and then through consultation, we just expand, um, and we listen to the needs, and if, if we need to develop more, um, then we absolutely do. Um, maybe Ryan can speak to more initiatives specifically that we have on the go, but uh, it is constantly evolving and we're constantly looking at ways to just continue to grow and continue to learn and, and continue to reach out. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah. And I would say that, you know, through formal and informal conversations to Aaron's point, uh, that is what truly drives our service delivery here in Halton. Uh, because what we've done as a policing sector for so long is thought that we knew the answers to everything and thought that we knew what the community wanted. And this is part of the reason why we're, uh, you know, there is that distrust and, and reasons why we've got it wrong. So, you know, our programs that we develop and initiatives, uh, we develop them strategically based on the feedback we're getting uh, from those that we interact with and have conversations with and many times tough conversations. So that's always changing as our region and as our region changes and grows. Uh, so will those programs and initiatives. 
Perfect. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, go ahead, Taiwo. I think you had next. Yeah. Thank you, Erin, for really like breaking down the priorities that you have. I think it's really good to see that um, there's more work that's been recognized that needs to be done. And um, there are plans on the way to working on that beyond just 2023, right? Um, so I'm going to move on to Lola. Um, so we talk a lot about um, changing the narrative and you know, knowing from your background and your lived experience, um, how have you been able to help create stories that would help us re re kind of like rewrite the negative perception, negative narratives that are being told about um, Black people? And I know you have, you've experienced some form of the story, but the work you do right now in the community is changing that narrative. So how can we, um, how are you doing that in terms of creating this story? Um, so I think um, one of the, so there's two, two layers. So I have a food brand, um, being African myself, I wanted to share my culture, uh, being Nigerian. And one of the ways, one of the things I always say that brings people together is uh, food and music uh, and sports. Um, so I think it's food is always a great thing. Music is always a great thing. Sports is always a great thing. And so sharing the passion that I have for food brings, you know, people together and cultures together. Plus I get to educate people and show people, uh, Canadians, a part of my culture that they're not aware of. That's one layer. And with that, I educate people about black culture, African culture, immigrant culture. I also encourage people who are, um, um, it, it's forced me to kind of be at the forefront because working in tech, you can be in the background a lot. You don't really have to show yourself, but being having that food brand has put me out there where I'm having interactions such as this um, and really being a face of, you know, the African community as well and being a black voice. Um, um, there's a book that I have here um, uh, from the CBC, CBC so talking about leading black voices. I was you know, recognized as a leading black voice by the CBC to talk about black stories. Um, so that's one of the ways having that image that corrects those biases that, you know, um, that sometimes comes um, culturally that even the police cannot necessarily detect, right? So there are some biases that people might have or prejudged uh, notions that they have based on their own personal experiences from home and culturally that can transcend into the workplace working with the police. So I think it's creating those images and those narratives that changes what people know about being black and about being you know, African and about being an immigrant and being Nigerian, because I know the police has had experiences um, with Nigerians, um, you know, those, those, you know, that trend that, oh, you're Nigerian and you're, there's that stigma that comes with it. Um, that, you know, people even joke about it that, you know, are you going to send me an email from a cousin that I won $1 million or something? And some of those things, it's like people are changing the narrative and saying Nigerians are brilliant people. We're highly skilled. We're highly educated. Uh, if you do the research of the people that have the most, one of the most successful immigrant um, pools that are most successful when it comes to tech, working in tech, and in those um, a lot of qualified industries, um, Nigerians will be at the top for sure. So in the Black community. So I think it's one of the things that I also try to emulate and show. Um, it's that changing that narrative and changing what people understand. Because a lot of times, as Canadians, I can't blame people for not knowing much more about my culture because if we're not speaking out about it, they're only going to know what the media is telling them. And what the media is telling them is usually the negative stuff, right? So we have to be the voice that really talks about our culture, talks about how well we're doing. Don't be shy. I think another layer about it, and I, what I always try to encourage people in my community is to speak out. Um, I think a part of our culture is that we stay in the background. We don't want to, you know, we don't want to, um, speak out too much. We don't want to be seen because we're still trying to adjust to this new environment. So um, part of our culture as well is like, you know, you somewhat fear the police. And so you're, you don't want to talk about like certain things. And so 
it's it's that kind of educating, I think, is something that maybe the police can, um, you know, the Halton region and just the police, uh, RCMP in general, can also talk about, like, having that open dialogue like you're doing now is really great because then it also changes my impression of the police, right, that I am also bringing from my country coming here as a new immigrant and also what the media is telling me. So the, the approach that I'm taking personally as an African or as a Black person to change the narrative is also what the police can do as well, because the media keeps putting it in our heads that the police is not your friend. And I've grown up in a culture where sometimes like the police is not your friend. And so, but the police is there to protect, to serve and protect. And so I think that's that kind of thing that where, you know, what you're doing today and that, um, um, goal that you have to create diversity so that there is diversity in the voices internally, right, and also externally, I think is important. So that internal, like they say, starts from the home. I think the home of the police or the RCMP office needs to also be diverse internally so that when you guys are having meetings you're, or you're having decisions being made internally, you're diverse in your perspectives. I think that's also, um, you know, something I'd like to share. Perfect. Thank you for that. Um, I like how you you touched on some, well, of course, some very key points, and one of them is the 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 biases that we're not really aware of, right? Um, and in terms of having our like us in the RCMP offices and higher up and so on like that is very vital because um once we have that then we can say the systemic part of it is kind of being eradicated mm -hmm. right so thank you for that as well um dj question for you um and this is pretty much a three-part question so if you need me to repeat anything feel free to ask me and i will while visiting the police region recently we at bmi noticed very few people that look like us would you say your police department is representative of the demographics of the community you serve? And if not, what actions is your region taking to ensure there is representation in the Halton police force? Lastly, do you have any input for them, them being the higher ups um, to help solve this issue? Yeah, that's a great question and thank you for it. So it's a very important one, but um, to be completely blunt and honest, no, we're not there yet. We're actually like, we're on our way there, but we're not there yet. And we're actually mandated under the Police Services Act to have a service that is reflected of the community we serve. Um, I know that minorities are underrepresented in our service and also other services all across Ontario and other professions too, whether it's public or the private sector. Um, and of course you can imagine what it will feel to be in a room where not many, if any, you know, people look like you or could relate to your history or as well as my experiences throughout life, like growing up in a neighborhood that faces issues such as gun violence or, you know, you haven't run into the law or unfortunate situations that you just happen to be present for or even having a lack of resources and not the same opportunities as other communities. Um, so we do have ways to go. And what I really enjoy about the Halton Regional Police Service is like what Aaron mentioned was our internal support networks and how minority groups that face challenges that are discriminated against that have been oppressed and you know treated less than human in society um how we uplift and support one another I remember when I first joined a little over a year ago and like I felt so out of place I felt so lost but then I was introduced to the black internal support network and you know just being in a room with with those officers, right? Like I can see and learn from people who look like me, right? Like the fact that I know experienced black road officers, black officers in specialized units, black sergeants, black superintendents, right? It just shows me what my options are in this field, but more importantly, it, it lets me know I can do it, right? And I feel like that's what we need. We need to like each one teach one kind of thing. And like Aaron mentioned, there's, there's other internal support networks as well. Um, like our women internal support network, South Asian, and also our LGBTQ plus internal support network. And we all support each other and our allies to um, one another. Um, I know in the Black internal support network, 
we also mentor people who one day want to become peace officers, even if it's not with the Halton region. Um, and in that, again, we try to inspire and motivate and just let them know it's possible, right? Like when I when I first joined the police service, I thought like there were so many people in my group of friends from my community that would be totally against it. But little did I know, like once I once I became a police officer, many people were reaching out to me, people who I would never assume would be a police officer. Just like how a lot of people wouldn't assume I would be a police officer, but they're reaching out to me, letting letting me know that they were in the middle of the process where they're at and that type of stuff. So again, like just just each one teach one. So to reiterate, um, we're not there yet in terms of representation, but there's a lot of good, great quality work being done. Um, and something that I keep in mind to keep me in a positive space is, is to, you know, just think of what it was in the past, right? 30, 40, 50 years ago, right? A police officer, a black police officer like myself, probably wouldn't even be able to be on this stage or be on this platform and sharing my thoughts and sharing my experience. Um, in terms of in terms of what we're doing, like action to make sure or to work towards having a more diverse police service to better represent our community. Um, Erin actually she's she has a great deal of experience in recruiting, so I guess I'll flip it to her so she can she can speak to the initiatives on the uh, recruiting side of things. Thank you, DJ. Um, I just quickly got to give a shout out uh, to Lola and, and just reiterate what she said about how food uh, is it seems to be a common language and uh, I had the privilege of going to an event actually through Black uh, Mentorship Inc and uh, such a blast and uh, I gotta I gotta say I, I never had chin chin before and for anybody out there that has not had chin chin before you really need to have chin chin uh, I think I'm gonna hit up Tim Hortons actually because once you have chin chin Timbits just don't cut it anymore. So thank you for that, uh, for introducing me and Puff Puffs too, but. Uh, I was just gonna say, wait till you try Puff Puffs. I tried those Puff donuts Puff. from Tim's are gonna be like, nah. <laughs> okay, so, so I do, Puff Puffs are probably more similar to Timbits and yes, they yes. to die for, but I, they were a bit bigger. I don't feel as guilty eating little chin chin. Yes, yes. But yeah, so <laughs> I, I, I thank you for that. And thank you to, to BMI because had I not, been a part of that, I wouldn't have um, experienced that. So, uh, but anyway, back to recruiting. Um, I think one of the things that uh, I became super passionate about in recruiting um, is it doesn't happen overnight. Um, and if we want, um, you know, I'll, I'll speak specifically to, to Black members, but, you know, you can replace that with any, any community that isn't represented well. Uh, but if you want to see, particularly leaders, um, and when you look at our organization in particular, it takes time um, because we can't hire somebody right to chief. They need to work up the ranks. Um, so the changes, they're, they're going to be slow, um, but I can assure you that they're deliberate because we do want to have more representation. And that's not because uh, somebody's telling us to, it's because it's the right thing to do. And how we get there is um, one of my mottos in recruiting, and, and that will continue uh, through anything is see it, be it. Um, and people, when they can see somebody like DJ or some of our other officers, Raf, who joined us, um, who's actually Nigerian, and, and he joined us on uh, at the event as well that I was talking about with the Chinchins, uh, you know, seeing officers uh, that you can relate to, um, especially when you're coming from your home country that may not uh, have police services similar to what we have in Canada, whether they're corrupt or, um, you know, racist or uh, not well respected as far as a, a career. Um, it's really important to not just encourage uh, people to join as a member. It's also important to work with their families to let them know that it's okay for their child to, to join this organization because we are different from what they may be coming from. Um, and so encouraging our, our newer members, like people like DJ, um, I have connected uh, newer or, or people I'm trying to recruit uh, to officers that they can relate to, whether that's through race, whether that's through uh, sexual orientation, whether that's through gender, uh, whether that's through similarities with maybe single parenting or people who have children or don't, um, to, to show that people have gone before you. So it's possible. And the more representation we have, the more we will attract. 
So we have targeted initiatives where we will um, obviously be included um, to everybody, but we will do a shout out to say we are looking um, for black officers, we're looking for black women, we're looking for black men, um, and we'll do uh, targeted recruiting efforts to try to um, attract very specific demographics, as well as uh, obviously including general, um, just you know, general interest. Um, but we will make deliberate efforts to try to embed in communities or areas, whether it's community centers or colleges or um, wherever we think we might be underrepresented to try to attract people um, through our current membership or through allies or people that can, um, you know, sort of um, encourage people to, to want to be a part of this. Um, and then more importantly, um, it's not just about hiring, it's about that belonging and that inclusivity. So it's it doesn't stop once we hire, it's looking after our members, um, because it is hard to be, um, from what I'm told, um, I can only speak from, uh, you know, 20 plus years ago, uh, there weren't as many women, um, certainly having that feeling, but, um, you know, it, it, I think it would be hard to be that token, you know, new officer from, you know, whatever demographic you want to insert. Uh, and so making sure that that officer has support uh, and is feeling included, because if you don't have that inclu inclusivity and you don't have that sense of belonging, then we're not going to retain those members. So it, it's not just about hiring, it's about continuing to look after those members and to continue to develop them so that they want to be a part of this organization for the long haul. And then, then you'll see the, the, um, the climb through leadership um, you know, in, in time. Wonderful. Thank you again. Your, your responses are making me want to say, where do I sign up? <laughs> I'll take your application. You can sign up right here, right now. <laughs> That's how I know you're in recruit. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Um, quickly, um, is there any input either of the three of you would have for any of the higher ups or, or, or do we think we're on a great track right now? I, I think uh, you know, if I'll jump in, I think, you know, Aaron touched on it, right? I think in the last few years, uh, definitely we've made an effort to attract that talent and that takes time to get to the higher levels of an organization, right? Especially if you're talking, you know, executive level, deputy chief or higher. So I think that will come in time. I think as a policing sector, you know, outside of Halton, we haven't historically done a good job. So you don't see that representation at higher levels because again, that that's reflected in time. Uh, but we're very mindful of taking a strategic approach to some of the efforts that Aaron's talking about, right? And, and you may ask, how do we, you know, where do we put our efforts in terms of targeted recruiting? We know that because we've invested in doing uh, employee census, uh, you know, and surveys. So we know what our organization looks like, you know, not 100% of our organization because it's voluntary, it's de-identified, uh, but we typically get about a 60% return rate. And you and I'm sure it's going to come up maybe in a question. What does the Halton Regional Police look like, right? And I can tell you that uh, 40 percent, uh, and this is sworn in civilian members, uh, not just uniform, but 40 percent uh, would identify as as a woman. 57 percent would identify as a male. You may ask that doesn't equal 100 percent of the results, but what I can tell you is you can choose to you know not answer that question. Uh, in terms of those that would identify as a member of the Black community, it's about 1.5 percent. So. Uh, to DJ's point, it's lower than the representation uh, in the region. 80% of our organization would identify as being uh, white or Caucasian. Um, you know, some quick stats, 8% would be considered Asian. That includes East Asian, South Asian. 3% would be considered uh, or would self-identify as being Indigenous. So we're very mindful of what our organization looks like. That's where we identify the gaps or opportunities. And that's where we actually go out and do the targeted recruiting. Perfect. All right. Um, I'm, I'm sure I speak on behalf of more than just me, but I appreciate all the, the initiatives and the focus that we've talking about so far. So thank you for those replies. Kadeem, I will, I will just I will just jump in though, and and I'll you know I'll put, I'll throw the uh, the wager out there, or I'll you know maybe make a prediction and say if we're still hopefully, and I, I'd like to think we are still hosting this in ten years, maybe we'll invite DJ back and he'll we'll see rank on that shoulder. But there it is. Perfect. There it is, Chief DJ. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Taiwo. 
Yeah, thank you. So I'm, I'm back on again. Um, thank you for that insightful experience because we actually do have youth in, in, in our audience today. So I think it's going to be inspiring for them to see that there are opportunities for them to get into that recruitment and also be part of um, the police if they wish to do so. And I like that um, DJ mentioned that there's some form of mentorship, which is something that can be a good start for them to um, get that mentorship going um, in understanding how it works with policing. I'm going to go over to, um, and do I do appreciate all the conversation that we've been having so far from all the panelists. Thank you for sharing all that insight. Um, moving on to David, um, thank you for being very patient with us. And I'll say still feel free to jump in once David is um, answering this question. Um, so for you, David, in addition to dealing with the challenges of youth, of being a youth, or just, you know, just really experiencing your youthful years, um, being a Black youth, you have to always kind of remain hyper vigilant around you. At least that is what most Black people, Black parents say to their children when they go out. And I'm sure you probably hear this often from your mom, right? It's been very vigilant, right? Would you be able to share some, um, some of your hopes for a better relationship with the police? So this is kind of like a question to you, but I also want to hear how the police can address it. So I, we want to hear what David has to say with regards to his hope being a youth and how we can uh, address that uh, relationship and trust with the police. Uh, first of all, I really wanted to say that it was really inspiring kind of hearing all the initiatives and kind of programs that are already in place, because a lot of these things I never really knew about. So it's great that there are efforts being made to improve the kind of relation and understanding with the police and the general Black community, people of color, all that in general. So I just wanted to say thank you for that and speaking on that and kind of like educating me and the audience on that. I think in terms of hopes for the future, I can just say that I hope to see more kind of understanding between the Black community and the police. And I think that understanding just really comes from engagement and being more involved in the communities you guys serve in like different ways. And I think Aaron spoke on being at the Black Excellence Gala. And I remember being there and seeing all the police officers there. And I really took in that I don't see police officers normally in my day-to-day -day life. That is not a normal occurrence for me. And I think most people can relate to that is that when you see a police officer, it's when, so when you did something wrong or when you're in trouble. And uh, my mom went to the Halton police uh, and when she was with uh, one of our volunteers at the time, and she was saying it was so weird for her to walk in there that she wasn't used to being there before and she felt out of place. And I think that is what a lot of people experience because we don't have many interactions with the police officers in our day-to-day -day life and seeing the police officers at the gala. I remember I saw a DJ on the dance floor near the end. It was very warm. It was very humanizing and really made me feel more comfortable and linked to you guys outside of the uniform and being more human in the sense. I was not saying you guys not, but I was able to relate to you guys on a different level that I feel like I wasn't able to before. So when I talk about my hopes for the future and seeing I want more understanding, I would love to see like police officers being more involved in the communities in ways like that, showing up to those events, showing up to schools, so kids can see you guys in a different light than always their own probably negative personal experiences or what the media tells us. Because at the end of the day, it's true that the media pushes so many of these like negative narratives. We see all these stories about the police, and it's hard not to internalize those on um, those biases and what you see. And you know, ignorance creates fear, and that works two ways. If I, as a black man, haven't seen a police officer in my daily life and I'm 20 year, years of age, naturally, when if I'm ever pulled over, stopped by the police, fear is gonna go what's what's what gonna go run through me because I've never had an interaction. I'm not used to it. So all these biases are not. So and I think even on social media. Uh, if you see, I think everyone has seen videos of cops playing basketball on the street or doing these little things, they always go viral because we don't really see it as being a normal occurrence. But things like that, it helps humanize the police, it helps create better understanding, and it helps break down the walls that could possibly be there. So yeah, my hopes for the future, just kind of greater understanding and see more things like all of y'all, the Black Excellence Scout, just being more involved in the community in those different ways. Thank you. Yes, I know yeah, what I, and that question was, I know, really directed to you, David, and I think, DJ, you can jump into like um, how or whatever, what kind of programs can be 
um, what do we have in place right now that addresses what David has uh, talked about? Sorry, I missed what you just said. I think you kind of went out for a second. Can you just repeat that? So um, the question was really directed to David, but then again, it's also indirectly um, to the police. So in, in terms of like creating an established relationship. So um, what what is existence at the moment in terms of how, uh, what David had mentioned, what he's looking to see, what has, what has happened so far? And you can just even jump into that, whatever you have. Yeah, no, definitely. I just wanted to um, add on to what David's saying. It's not only it's not only the public that needs to see police in a different light, but the police need to see the public in a different right in a different light, right? Just because I'm black, it doesn't mean I understand every single thing that David is going through in life, right? So, right, if we're getting our or if we're seeing most of black people on on the media, just like what David's saying, portrayed in a negative light. And we're not really doing that engagement piece, like showing up to the basketball courts or showing up to the events or, you know, having these presentations or um, engaging with the community. If we don't, if, if we're not communicating with the public, then we're going to be forced, like it kind of, it kind of makes us see the public in the light that the media is portraying, right? That negative, that negative, um, that negative light. So, you know, we have to keep that communication going, that engagement going, that back and forth dialogue. So let's say one day I run into, into David, right? I already developed a rapport with him and that'll make things go even a lot more smoother, right? Like there's, there's just so many, there's just so many elements to developing a rapport, right? Like it's not just, it's not just having events, but it's actually getting to know the culture, getting to know the issues, you know, getting to know what this community likes, right? How they celebrate, all those things come into factor, right? So like, just like David's saying, like we have to, we have to keep continuing to do these things and have David and others see us in a different type of light, right? Like, and similar to what David, like growing up for me, and I think someone in the in, in, in the question and answer had a question, but I'll answer that later. But um, growing up for me, right? Like similar, I never seen police in a light where it was all, all smiles, right? Every time I've seen police growing up for the most part, it was all riled up, right? And I can, I can say, now that I'm on this side of it, I get it because there's some there's some moments where we do have to take control over a situation to protect the public. Right. But from the public point of view, it can be a different type of thing, especially when we hear about what's going on, not just in like Halton, but all over the world with police services. Something happens in the States and it's going to it's going to be impacting us down here. Right. So all these things, they're important. They come into play. And, you know, if we're not working together. Right. And if we're not getting to know one another, then it's going to be hard to come together when it's time to work out a solution or to work out a problem or just to walk by and say hi. Right. So that's really what I, I really wanted to add. Awesome. Thank you for that for that input there. Does anyone have any anything extra to I add to that? I wanted to add to that because like I think what DJ said like, really does mean a lot. And like when he said about even the police kind of like becoming more comfortable with the community, I think that is so relevant because you guys are in charge of like protecting the community. And I can't speak too much on it. I'm not a police officer, but I, I'm, you guys spoke a little bit about the units you guys have been a part of. And I'm sure you guys hear about all the kind of dangers and things that you guys will have to face and things that you guys have to deal with. And let me put you guys on edge. And I think just being more involved in community and more in a lighter sense will maybe have you guys a little less tense. So when the, you do come into contact with a person of color or anyone in the community, you guys are maybe a little bit more ease because you had, of course, you had these more intense interactions, but you've also had these more relaxed ones in the uniform they help strike a balance and i think that just helps improve the relationship right so i think we want to say i appreciate what dj said and that yeah, um sense. definitely i think the common theme there is um human right we're all human and if we see one another as human we're more likely to treat each other as such right instead of with these preconceived notions of as they are now in some aspects right so thank you both for those uh, great responses. Um, Ryan, Aaron, or DJ, any, any one of you can answer this or all of you if you like. Um, as we all know, undesirable encounters can create distrust towards the police, especially in racialized communities, yet the police must do their work of protecting our communities. How can we strike a balance um, 
how can we strike a balance with this? And again, anyone of you can answer or all of you, if you'd like. Yeah, maybe Kadeem, maybe I'll jump in and then Aaron and uh, DJ, if they want to want to top things up. But, you know, the reality is there's there's two ways to look at undesirable encounters. There's, you know, police, you know, uh, misconduct and, you know, an overuse of force or, um, you know, overpower uh, or utilizing or, you, you know, utilizing their power inappropriately. And then there's undesirable encounters where we're acting in the duties of our role. Uh, right, where there's times where maybe we do have to make arrests and lay criminal charges, and that would be considered an undesirable uh, encounter. Uh, so I'm more going to speak to uh, those times where the conduct and integrity of the police officer or policing organization are called into question. And, you know, we balance that or we, we help uh, mitigate that erosion of trust by holding those members accountable who act in that way. Uh, you know, we as police officers, uh, whether you're in a leadership role or not, have to step up and speak out against uh, that misconduct and that behavior that erodes that trust. We have to hold ourselves accountable, but we also have to empower those mechanisms that can hold us account accountable, like those civilian oversight boards and otherwise. So that's the first thing. You know, we have to hold ourselves to the highest standard. Uh, the other piece, you know, is you know, I would be naive to tell you that some of these interactions which we've seen in the last few years are never going to happen again. I would hope that they would never happen here uh, and halt indefinitely, but also I hope that they would never happen again, but that's just not a reality. So when those things happen, we need to be more transparent with that process, right? There's so many unanswered questions that happen when there's uh, police uh, misconduct or where there's questions about police actions uh, and we don't do a good job at giving information to the community. And that misinformation uh, or that the lack of giving information, uh, you know, can fester and grow and allow for uh, counterproductive uh, narratives to happen that impact policing organizations and most importantly, impact the communities. So that accountability piece and that transparency piece, we don't do a good job at and we need to do a better job. Uh, in terms of some of the undesirable accountables, the reality is public safety is paramount. And that is our number one job, uh, and whether it's those that are victimized uh, or those that are, um, you know, committing these these crimes. You know, we have to uphold public safety and we have to react to those things. Uh, and regardless of whether police are justified, for example, in the application of force or not, there's typically an underlying issue uh, of why somebody has had a interaction with the police. And we can all agree that most people don't call the police when they're having a good day. Uh, they're calling us because they're having one of the worst days of their life and something's happening that they most likely have lost control over and they need us to come in and assist with that. So to the underlying issue point that has led to the contact with, with law enforcement, something that we've done really well in Halton that, that I feel is that we've adopted a community safety and well-being lens to mitigate that risk, to really prevent future contact with the police uh, proactively, trying to understand what those underlying issues are, to provide supports, connect people with community organizations and stakeholders outside the policing sector, the true experts in those fields, uh, and, and developing, uh, you know, upstream, upstream interventions uh, to hopefully avoid the contact at all. Uh, you know, as I said, these interactions most likely will happen again, unfortunately, and it takes one of those things uh, to erode trust completely. So we have to hold ourselves accountable, be transparent, and we have to develop ways to try to reduce uh, somebody even coming in contact with the police because to be candid, every interaction with the police when we're looking at public safety and upholding the law is uh, can be perceived as negative. Nobody wants to have those interactions. So I don't know if DJ or Aaron wanted to top something up there, but uh, that would be my thoughts on that. I'll just add uh, briefly when we're talking about negative interactions, and um, you know, if it's if it's specific to individuals, and you know, we may be confronted by the actions of our brothers or sisters, um, and you know, and somebody's interaction with, say, me, is, is tainted because of that previous experience, I think the biggest thing 
um, that we need to do is not deny that, not to deny the, that, you know, that feeling or that reality that maybe that did happen and that's their perception. Um, but just to in, empower and encourage our officers to, um, to strive to ensure that their own interactions uh, leave that positive imprint. Um, we can't, you know, um, you know, yes, obviously we can apologize on behalf of, you know, just I'm sorry you had that experience and I'm sorry you feel that way, but let me, let me try to give you a better experience or let me try to share information. As David said, ignorance, you know, it, it can, it can be such a, um, a powerful thing uh, and, and can, can really prevent us from moving forward and, uh, you know, sharing information, sharing different perspectives within reason, um, you know, and, and just keeping that communication open to, you know, be transparent and to explain, um, you know, where we're coming from and, and to just ensure that uh, each of our members are, 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 you know, striving for all their interactions to be as positive as possible and being mindful of the perception um, that people may have coming into an interaction that's beyond our control in that moment. Um, the other thing just to top up um, is that, you know, it, it's a relatively new EDI work, um, you know, and it's, it's sometimes hard work and it's sometimes hard conversation, not sometimes, a lot of times hard conversations that sometimes people aren't ready to have. And, uh, you know, one of the things I'm proud of that this service is working towards doing and, and, and doing is, uh, you know, making sure officers, uh, all officers in our service have, uh, training in in their own biases, how to recognize them, um, you know, their own um, innate biases and perceived biases, whatever kind of bias. Um, officers are trained on that now. We didn't have that training years ago. Uh, that wasn't stuff we talked about. Uh, those are conversations and training that's being had for people to check those things, to have those conversations, and to really challenge positions that we didn't challenge in the past in ourselves. Um, so those are things that are happening for officers across the board that's mandatory. Um, and then beyond that, um, uh, you know, as, as Sergeant Smith alluded to, you know, looking at those interactions through our oversight committees, whether it's professional standards and, you know, and looking for those elements of bias or racism or things that we can then provide training or, um, you know, additional corrective behaviors or discipline um, to try to mitigate those experiences and those occurrences and, and really, um, you know, close the door on, on um, tolerating any form of racism or discrimination uh, within inside too. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, go ahead, EJ. Yeah, I know just to add, um, when it comes to trust and distrust, like I mentioned before, right, like the actions of others, right, like a negative interaction with the police, it, it doesn't even have to be me, it can be something that happened years ago, and then I can just be running into that individual and then you know, they don't see me for me, they just see me for the uniform and then boom, they get triggered. And then, you know, I like, I also keep in mind that, especially, especially um, in my community, that once I became a police officer, um, not all, but some people who I grew quite fond of and grew up with, they're kind of just like, yeah, no, like, how could you do that? You were on that, like, like you experienced those things with us and then you still made that decision, right? So yeah, no, we're not going to be messing with you anymore. And I totally get it. Like I made the decision knowing that could possibly happen. But um, well, what I try to do is I just try to make every interaction a personable one, right? Like I try my hardest to make sure that, right? doesn't matter how the situation started, but when we, but when we're, when the situation is over, did it end well? Was it a positive experience? Did I do the best thing? Like did I do the best possible things that I can do to make sure that you walk away with an experience that wasn't the worst, right? I remember one time we were at a domestic call and we had to we had to arrest the father and mother went to the hospital. So I was in the house watching the kid and in my head, I'm just like, there's no way I can make this kid's day better, right? There's no way I can be like, hey, like I'm here to protect you or whatever, right? Like you just witnessed a whole bunch of stuff that you probably never want to see in your life. You never want to see in your life. So what I did is I just, I just thought of a way with connecting with him and I saw him playing his PlayStation and I'm pretty good at NBA 2K. So I was just like, hey, like let's run a few games. And next thing you know, he was telling his friends like, hey, I'm playing, I'm playing NBA 2K with a police officer. I never thought I'd be able to do this, all that stuff. So again, like I'm not there to like, like if, if I could fix your life, I would like within the snap of a finger, but I have to be honest and realize that not every situation is gonna be a perfect situation. But just like what my college basketball coach would say, he's like, we're never gonna be perfect, but let's get as close as we can, right? So that's 
that's kind of the mentality I have. Even if I'm walking into the worst of situations, I try to treat that person with respect and courtesy because I know what it feels like to be on the other side of that, right? To be at your worst and at your lowest moment and feel like nobody cares for you. So all this stuff I keep in mind when I'm interacting with the public and, you know, my work, it, it speaks for itself. I can't, I can't speak for the other officers, um, especially the ones who put us in predicaments where the next encounter is going to be a negative one, right? But I can definitely speak for myself. And um, that's how I try to approach to strike a balance, even though it's hard to balance because some situations are just out of your control, but try to get as close as I can to make it, making it something positive. Right. Yeah. I, again, I appreciate all the responses we're getting here tonight. And I know if I was a kid in that situation where an officer comes over to me, he starts playing 2K with me or whatever, like that, that's something I'll carry with me to say, okay, so not all of them are bad, right? Or not all of them would act in a certain manner towards people like us, right? Um, so Ryan, you said um, an arrest is undesirable. Like That's not what you're searching for. So I appreciate you kind of pointing that out because some people would have a different notion to say, well, they're trying to bother me and they're trying to arrest me or get me in trouble, right? Um, the lack of information sharing, you pointed that out as well, which I appreciate. Um, Aaron, and I think all three of you really talked about that higher, st higher standard and holding yourself to, or all of us really, holding ourselves to a higher standard. Um, and, and so I just wanted to kind of touch on those things because those are very valuable and important, I think, pieces of this conversation that need to be kind of pointed out. So thank you for that. Go ahead, Taiwa. Thank you so much. Thanks for all that input. Um, so we're just moving to the last part of our questions before we open up the Q&A, which would um, come right after this last question. And this would be for Lola and David. Um, I know you're both representing the community in this conversation, and it will, it will be great to hear your voice um, in regards to this question. So we all want to have like a better relationship with the police. And we've talked a lot about you know, building trust and creating and engaging and having a better relationship with the police. Um, but the truth is that as a community, um, we have a role to play to ensure that the police are not always seen as the enemy. So um, Lola and David, if you can just respond to this question, what would be your call to action for everyone that's listening on here, anyone that might be what would be your call to action to what you want to see? You can go ahead, David. I'll go first, I guess. Uh, what I would say as a call to action, I think, I think we spoke that a lot of responsibility does fall on the police, but what I would say to like just the Black community, just to be open, be open-minded, because when it comes to all these initiatives that you guys are implementing or the mentorship, they all mean a lot, but it doesn't mean anything if the Black community isn't willing to reciprocate, isn't willing to join in, isn't willing to take steps and like DJ and become the uh, police officer. Maybe he's the only one in his neighborhood with that ambition, and maybe his other people are kind of holding him back. And it's all about taking the first step and being open-minded to changes that are being made, because we can't approach the, the situation with the same preconceived notions that may be used against us. So it's in, it would be part of the change. We just need to be open-minded and help interact in any way we can. Yeah, that, that's, that's brilliant, David. I'm uh, just going to piggyback on that. It's really just about the community as well being open. I think like uh, Evangeline has created through the BMI, having that opportunity for the uh, RCMP to come have open dialogue uh, with the community is great. So in your churches, in your school, like be that spokesperson and say, hey, you know, I know, you know, DJ, um, I have his contact, I have, you know, I know Ryan, I know Aaron, and I think they'll be happy to come have a conversation at our school. Um, can I, you know, reach out to them? I think, you know, through your church, through your communities that you have, I think, having that open, now knowing that the RCMP is actually open to creating these opportunities to have that relationship with the community. I think on us, it's also inviting them, like, you know, inviting them into our, our own, you know, I would say our own safe spaces, right? So um, we know that if we're in that safe space and the RCMP comes there, then you feel comfortable because you have, you know, your community behind you. And so, 
Um, I think it's 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 kind of like that, you know, uh, symbiotic relationship that needs to develop from there. But like, yeah, a lot of that also is on the RCMP to continue to show uh, that they're open to that relationship. And the way to do that is, you know, like, you know, I love that. I know that example that DJ gave, like playing that video game, even I at my age, if I, <laughs> you know, when I see the RCMP and they're friendly, I'm excited. It's, it's nice. Like, you know, it's not something that, you know, happens often, but when, when you, when you see that it's, it's something that sticks with you um, for a long time. So um, I imagine that that child um, had an, an amazing experience after that bad, you know, start of his day. So I think, you know, it's just continuing to uh, find ways to also show that you're open um, and you're approachable, uh, even though you're doing serious work, um, protecting people, I think um, creating that balance and educating and training um, officers and the RCMP to also kind of have that communal idea or mindset to change the narrative. Thank you so much, Lola and David. And yes, um, it's really just restating what had been discussed earlier today. Um, but coming from um, Lola and David that are experienced, um, that have the leave experience, I think, yeah, it's really very important that we have, we keep having that open conversation and being very approachable to establishing relationships. Because I mean, for a re relationship to be established, it has to be some form of connection and openness and willingness to um, welcome that. So um, I believe um, that brings us to the end of the question. From our side, we do have a series of questions coming in from the Q&A, um, which we'll have to moderate. And there might be some questions that may have been responded to. So um, just for time purposes, we would um, probably just combine a few of them if we have responded to them and just um, kick it into, into that. I think Evangeline is on here too, right? Um, I am. Hi. Okay. Yes. So I'll just pass it on to you to help us pick up on that yeah, Q and A question. Well, okay. the amazing conversations, everybody. You are so brave, you know, coming up here to basically face some of these questions uh, that is really difficult uh, sometimes, but oftentimes very necessary. There's a couple of questions. I'm gonna kind of skip through it as fast as I can, and um, perhaps really open these questions to anybody. So I'm not necessarily going to have the police addressing it, even though some of them are addressed to you guys. I really would love to hear from our change makers here, David and Lola, you know, from your lived experiences as well. Uh, so anybody here, feel free to take any of these questions. Uh, before becoming a police officer, uh, this is directly to the police, what were some of the challenges that you faced? I think DJ, this was uh, addressed to you. Um, you know, that you face being a member of the Black community. This is coming from Sean. Hey, Sean, how are you? Yeah, so um, to answer that, some of the challenges I face with the police, um, being a member of my community in Lawrence Heights, uh, random, random stops, mm. whether I was driving with a friend or I was coming home from school, I was walking home from school with friends or, and then police officer would come up and say that my friend fits the description of someone who stole a phone across the city. So like that stuff was happening. Um, I also wasn't the best or most well-behaved growing up. So I did get into to, um, a trouble a few times. Um, and also on the traumatic side of things, uh, I've been, I've been, I've been in a house at a point in my time where the police raided it a few times. So I've had guns pointed at me um, and all that stuff. And also, again, just living throughout the community, I was always hyper vigilant. Um, interactions were, were rarely um, positive for me. But honestly, the way that I see it is like everything in life happens for a reason. And a part of the reason Part of the many reasons why I became a police officer is to, you know, remember how I felt growing up and all the all the all the challenges I faced, and kind of not wanting someone else to go through those things or kind of 
if someone is going through those things, kind of be there for them, right? Kind of being the police officer I wish I had around um, when I was younger, right? Like I wish I had Ryan and, and Aaron around when I was younger. Um, and then maybe things would have been a lot more smoother growing up, but my life, my experiences, my upbringing brought me here today. So um, I'm forever grateful. But yeah, those are those are some of the challenges um, I face with, with the police growing up. Hmm, thank you. Interesting. I'm glad that didn't stop you from pursuing your dream, really. So bravo to you and anybody here, really. Um, hopefully, DJ's story will encourage you to perhaps join the police force, uh, you know, irrespective of what your experience would have, uh, has been. Erin, uh, you are aware that a Black girl in 2021 in Ontario was arrested while in school. What programs do you uh, have in place to stop racism while policing and or interacting with police people? Uh, in your presentation so far, you did not address specifically the question of racism. Do officers get fired for being racist? Well, there's a whole bunch of questions in there. Um, with respect to a specific incident, without reference or, um, you know, I, I um, I, I can't speak to any specific incident. Uh, I will say I'm sure there's many um, black students that have been arrested in, in high schools. That's, you know, a reality, um, you know, an unfortunate position or place uh, for an arrest to occur at any time. Um, as far as uh, our experience in schools, um, that's been a challenge, um, not only because of COVID, but some of the political climate um, and some of the challenges we face there. Uh, that's a relationship um, you know, specific with the school boards that as a police service, we're trying very hard uh, to uh, bridge and amend um, uh, where our position in the schools has, has been, um, uh, had basically um, needs some adjustment, um, both on our, uh, our side and from the political side. Uh, you know, we recognize that uh, we want to be in the schools um, not just absolutely not for enforcement, but for support uh, and, you know, to, to provide um, programs that mirror what we have for our officers internally. How do we support our youth? How do we, you know, build those relationships? So um, as far as the school is concerned, uh, it's hard for us to address that as, as a service because, again, we're facing some political changes where uh, we're trying to bridge that and mend that relationship. Um, but our goal is to be in schools in some capacity to offer that support. Um, as far as um, specific, uh, our officers fired for racism, um, again, um, you know, I, I don't know of any cases specifically. Uh, that would be something at a, I, I've never fired anybody. I, I'm way too low on the totem pole uh, to be responsible for that. But uh, I know that when it comes to uh, an officer's career, uh, there are several dis disciplinary measures and governing bodies that will address um, factors, whether it's racism or excessive force um, or those incidents. Um, termination, um, just like any other job, would be the last resort um, as far as, um, you know, trying to address uh, the behaviors. Uh, I hope that kind of answers that. I don't know if maybe Ryan wants to jump in on that. Um, as far as some of the other questions, I, I, I'm losing track of, there was a, a few in there, but if you want to um, refresh me or, or Ryan wants to jump in where I've missed, I'd, I'd certainly appreciate Sure. Before Ryan jumps in, uh, Erin, just so you know, you can also type answers. So, oh, okay. Yeah, you can go back and read the question um, on your own and you can type a response. Ryan, I have a question for you and you can chip in on the previous one as you answer this particular question. Awesome. Um, so, somebody said here, Ryan, you mentioned you've been part uh, of the past. Uh, conversations that were had, to what extent would you say engaging with the police, uh, you know, with the halting regional police, uh, what have you guys done um, to improve the relationship between the police and the Black community, being that we've been having these conversations for some time? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think I touched on it earlier. I think these conversations are so important because these are what actually drive change within our organization and how we deliver policing services. And BMI is one of the many organizations that we have these conversations with, both formally and informally, publicly and not. 
right? And I would tell you that uh, Aaron spoke about some of the initiatives training that you know are unique to our police service. And what I would say is that every one of those uh, has been developed as a result of conversations with the community. And my expectation as, as a supervisor and as a leader within this organization is that we don't do things unless we consult with the community and understand that it's specifically meeting their needs. And if we don't do that, then uh, we're missing a big piece of things. So uh, the short answer is it actually drives everything we do and it should drive everything we do. I will touch a little bit on uh, what Aaron said um, in terms of the school piece. Uh, and then there's been discussions among, uh, about police being in schools, whether they should be or they should not be. Uh, what I would tell you is that I'm a big believer that police should be in schools. However, it should not be from an enforcement standpoint. It's from a relationship building standpoint. And we need to be cognizant that, and I think David touched on it, uh, he's had very limited opportunities to have interactions with police. And the last thing we want as an organization and as a policing sector is that his first interaction is a negative one. So uh, where can we build those positive relationships and have uh, positive interactions with youth? It's where youth are, and that's in schools. So should we be in schools uh, from an enforcement standpoint? Absolutely not. Is there an opportunity to deliver some very critical initiatives in schools to build those relationships and break down barriers? I believe so maybe up for a different discussion. And then in terms of the racism piece, um, you know, it depends on, you know, what the actual incident is, no different than any, let's, you know, compare it to a, a criminal offense. Is it a theft or is it something involving violence? The consequences are different, right? What I can tell you in Halton is very, we have a very clear and robust bias-free uh, policing policy. And we've adopted that so that we can actually hold people accountable when, they do things uh, that is driven by bias or racism. And again, that can vary depending on what's actually occurred and what the misconduct is. But depending on the severity, it can result in somebody being fired. You know, there's no question about that. But that policy that we've created here organizationally um, gives us the tools and the teeth to actually hold these officers accountable. And uh, it's something, you know, that we take very seriously. So. Um, thank you for addressing that. Um, again, Lala and David, I know most of these questions are directed to the police. Feel free to let me know if you want to share any of your lived experiences in terms, you know, with regards to this question. Um, so I have another question on this question. Yeah, go ahead, David. I just wanted to jump in on the past what thing that Lion was saying in both of the schools. It's kind of a question for myself towards Lion, just out of my own curiosity, because I remember in my elementary school, we had police officers come in to deliver the Dale program as, uh, I think it's called Bravo now, but as kids enter high school and things like that, I was just wondering your own personal opinion, what you think that relationship would look like having police in the schools? Do you think it should be in a teaching role, in a counseling role? I was just kind of curious about your own opinion and what that would look like. Because I do agree that it is necessary to help build those relationships. Yeah, so what do I think that looks like? I think it looks at, uh, you know, delivering educational opportunities that are specific to police. Uh, again, what we've done a really bad job at as a policing sector in many years is taking on responsibilities and not allowing the experts to actually lead that work. So from a counseling standpoint, mental health, um, similar factors or things such as that, we're maybe not the best to deliver that in the schools, but when we're looking to, you know, maybe educate them about substance abuse, alcohol, drugs, or otherwise, uh, we have a role to play in that. When we talk about public safety, pedestrian safety, traffic safety, we absolutely have a role to play in that. So as long as we're making sure that we're staying in our lane, for lack of a better term, I think there's ton of a ton of value. And I would say, you know, me as a graduate of the D.A.R.E. program, um, it was something that drove me to get into policing. And I, I don't want to date myself, um, but I, when I graduated in 1999, I actually have the plaque in my office, my D.A.R.E. plaque, because it was the moment when I met this incredible officer. And I said, this person's doing great work and has made a difference in my life. And I want to hopefully uh, do that for others. So, you know, I'm one example. DJ is one example. No doubt, Aaron is. It's, you know, these are where we build relationships and where we actually have an impact. But again, it has to be very specific to policing 
And we need to ensure that we're working with those community stakeholders and organizations to supplement that messaging, not lead it. Mm -hmm. awesome. have, uh, maybe we need to start looking into how we can embed that into curriculum, you know, moving forward. Um, talking about, you know, the impact that somebody did, uh, another police did for you, right? Um, representation matters. And so I'm looking at this next question and this individual is asking about uh, the steps that you are taking, you know, to bridge the gap uh, and promote more diversity in the service. And most chipping part of the reason why BMI is here today is the lack of black people in leadership positions. Uh, and I, I, I don't know about halting region per se, right? But when I look across the chiefs and all of that, rarely would you see a black or colored person. So um, any insights on that? Yeah, and I spoke to it a little bit earlier. And the challenge is that historically, again, policing have not done a good job at, you know, attracting diverse talent or investing in attracting diverse talent and retaining that. And again, it takes time to reach the level of chief, right? Like, uh, I think we joked earlier about DJ being the chief, but he's not going to be the chief in the next five or 10 years. That's just a reality because, you know, somebody needs that experience, work through multiple ranks to get there. And as we start attracting those from different backgrounds and who have different lived experiences and perspectives, and as time goes on, and as we invest to develop those members, uh, which BMI uh, can is very much aligned in that vision, as we invest in those members, we're going to start seeing them in leadership positions. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm mindful that, you know, from a business standpoint and from a service delivery standpoint, uh, diversity in our teams drives positive outcomes. There's no questions. It's not debatable. Um, so that doesn't need to be the color of your skin. That can be the perspectives you have. Again, those lived experiences. So I think there's two things. We need to attract that talent to that org to our organization. Then we need to invest in growing it. And it's going to be a legacy piece, you know, probably well past I'm gone, where the future leaders are DJ and the future leaders are Aaron and others um, that you're going to see at deputy chief and chief levels. Amazing. I'm going to uh, skip some of these questions. And please, I'm encouraging you to type answers so people can have your responses. And if we can shorten the time in, in answering this question, somebody make a remark that I think I need to say out here. Um, negative narratives are not coming from nowhere, they say. Can we please correct that position? Uh, negative narr uh, narratives exist because of racism that exists in policing. Uh, not only does racism exist in, in within policing, but also in schools. Uh, negative narratives will continue. I'm really hoping that negative narratives, uh, yes, we know it will continue, but by what we're doing today, by all of your answers and your braveness, that we continue, like what Lola said, you know, to do our own part to help to break down that negative narratives. Um, just going up again, uh, somebody said, uh, many police officers acknowledge racial profiling that occurs in the community. What actions are being taken to avoid this? Do you want me to jump in and then Aaron and DJ, you want to top up maybe? Uh, probably again, speaking to our, uh, you know, bi our bias-free policing policy, which is very clear. Uh, what I can tell you is that here within the region of Halton, and I'm, and I'm mindful that there's barriers to making complaints against police officers to their own policing organizations. I get the optics of that. Uh, we have very little to no complaints in regards to, uh, you know, interactions with members of the public that's driven by racism. I'm telling you that's not a reflection on what's actually happening. I'm just telling you it probably speaks to those within the community who are not comfortable actually reporting it to us, which is just as big of a problem. Uh, so, you know, we work very closely with civilian oversight agencies that can, you know, you know, take those complaints, investigate them, and then report to our chief of, of police, who then, you know, can administer any type of uh, remedial and or discipline that comes from them. So there's various mechanisms to do that. We as a policing sector need to do a better job at, you know, ensuring there's no barriers even to those civilian oversight agencies, because a police service that tells you that they don't have issues with officers uh, stopping people based on race and bias are not telling the truth. Or there's such a lack of trust within a community that they're just not even reporting it to you. 
So I don't know, DJ or Aaron, if you wanted to jump in or Lola or David and, and give your perspective on that as well. But that's just something I've experienced and seen. I just wanted to, uh, again, kind of ask another question because you kind of spoke on how people don't report issues that uh, they may have encountered in the police. So in terms of all the kind of initiatives we spoke on prior, I was just wondering how you guys go about survey surveying the community and seeing what initi initiatives do need to be implemented if people aren't doing the report as they should. Yeah, so we embed that within our strategic planning, which were mandated under the Police Services Act and our Police Services Board actually quickly, the structure of a policing organization, we have a chief of police. The chief of police reports to a civilian police services board, a governance oversight. And through them and the ministry, we're mandated to do a strategic plan every three years where we go out and do pretty in-depth community consultations and get a, you know, get a pulse of how the community feels and what they think our strategic priorities are. So we don't actually even develop our strategic priorities without consultation from the community and an understanding of where there needs to be programs and initiatives. That's fully driven by the community and perceptions, reality, how people feel is integrated through that, right? So uh, again, not a perfect system. We recognize that when we talk about complaints, uh, you know, you have some of our own members investigating our own members. I'm alive to what that looks like and how that adds to a lack of trust. So there are civilian oversight agencies as well that you can make those complaints to, but again, they're not perfect either. So, you know, we need to find a way uh, where people feel comfortable coming forward and, you know, expressing their concerns or speaking to misconduct of a police officer where it can be truly independently investigated and where people can be held accountable. And that's that big accountability piece I spoke of is mm -hmm. that, you know, even if someone were to report it and we don't hold that person accountable to the level we should, you've lost the next 10 plus many who will actually come forward. So. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to say one more thing in regards to that question and then I'll pass it off to you guys. Uh, I, they spoke about how negative narratives don't come from anywhere. And I didn't believe that's so true. Uh, I think I spoke on this earlier, but I feel like most of these negative narratives come from ignorance and ignorance of perception of what uh, maybe the police view the communities they're serving to actually be like in terms of like critical race theory and how things that affects the community. So I was wondering what type of initiatives are in the police to ensure that the police are educated about the communities they are going to serve in terms of what it actually looks like out there and how we can help deal with the racism that may be kind of in the police that's un unpronounced to y'all. Yeah, and, and Aaron spoke on it a little bit in terms of our training, and that's a great question. What we've done is we've heavily invested in training, uh, anti-racism bias training for all new members of the organization at every level. Prior to going to the police college, it's embedded during their at the during their time at the police college. We've put it into when they come back from the police college, and then six months later when they come back with their time with their coach officer. And it's not just organizations coming in and delivering this training. We actually bring them out and immerse them in the community and culture through place of worship tours, hearing from community leaders, and actually being involved in having those conversations so they get that new perspective. And that actually translates into more equitable policing services because there's that in-depth understanding of the challenges. Much like today, you know, we're lucky and truly lucky, myself, Aaron, and DJ, because we get to have these conversations all the time. And we understand the challenges and we can share that with other members, but you don't truly get it unless you see it. And that's what we're trying to work towards as, a, as an organization for our members to immerse themselves and understand where those challenges are, but most importantly, why there's those challenges, right? Uh, just like, just gonna add to that, sorry, David, um, just, um, to, just to pull it back even further, um, our hiring processes previously were, were dated. Um, and in the last year or two, um, the uh, Ontario Association Chiefs of Police, uh, just in a nutshell, who governs 
um, most things with policing, there's bodies over bodies over bodies that, that dictate and govern what we do. Um, so in terms of hiring, uh, there are ideally strategies and, and, and things that have been researched and practices that are implemented for practices uh, in our hiring. Those were somewhat dated. Uh, and previously, there wasn't a lot of talk around uh, personal qualities and officers, there were um, in terms of diversity and in inclusivity. Um, that process has be, been revamped um, and some of the um, interviewing strategies and some of the recruiting initiatives are really looking at um, inclusivity and, and uh, diversity and embedded qualities within officers that we weren't screening before um, at hiring. So we're looking at new generations of police officers and, and really looking at those character traits coming in that weren't always previously identified, um, you know, um, prior to the last couple of years. And that again speaks to, you know, the training, you know, we're, 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 we're playing catch up. We made mistakes in the past in our, you know, not recognizing that as a priority in our hiring. Uh, and maybe some of our police services are reflective of that from the officers that may have those character flaws. Uh, we're hoping to identify those earlier now um, so that we're hiring the right people with those values and those traits uh, that really uh, work towards treating people with respect and, uh, you know, and, and, and creating those, um, those relationships right from the beginning. Amazing. Um, I'm actually looking, we're out of time and uh, people are still here. We can try to answer a couple of questions. Um, somebody said here, I think halting police can bring the community together by having an open house at their divisions, music, food, face painting, you name it. Uh, guess what? We actually uh, talked about this and we are encouraging, we're going to look into planning a date uh, 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 and we will let you know the date exactly that we are inviting all the young people and everybody here actually uh, that joined the session. If you want to come out that day, um, please come and uh, the uh, uh, Ryan here and team has graciously agreed to give us a tour of the police station and Ryan promised food. Okay. Um, and yeah, and Ryan, I can help organize Chin Chim and Pop Pop as well. Just let me know. <laughs> you know, but we will communicate what date that will be. Uh, so watch out on our website uh, and uh, social media pages uh, for when that will be. Um, somebody said, realize this program was put in place because Black experience uh, racism in schools. Um, yes, uh, not just that, really. We put this program in place because we believe it's very important for us to continue to have these open conversations. That's how change happens, right? By having these conversations, we understand what needs to be changed. And we are also able to tell each other the truth about things that are not going well. You know, so these conversations, we will continue to have it and feel free to let us know whatever that you want us to discuss in next sessions like this and we will bring it forward to you. Somebody said, what is the contact name and email for this event? Uh, you can send us email at info at blackmentorshipinc.ca and we should be able to address any questions that you have. Um, other than that, this has been amazing. I really applaud everyone here, especially you courageous um, policemen. Uh, obviously, we talk about negative narratives. So I know you coming up here, you know that, um, you know, there may be a question that perhaps you, you may not be comfortable to address. But Ryan said to me, Evangeline, don't worry about that. We are here. We want to build community. We want to understand what we can do better, you know, because like he keeps saying, we're not perfect. The processes are not perfect. So are we, uh, the Black community, we are not perfect either. But by us having these brave, courageous conversations continuously and going to each other's events, right? So uh, we get to understand each other even more and hopefully we get to do better as a community. Ryan, any last thoughts? Yeah, you know what, you uh, you nailed it on the head there. I think it's so important, and it's really it's time for it's time for us to listen. And and this is what conversations like this allow us to do. Uh, first, it allows us to understand again what some of the concerns are, and then first acknowledge them. But then, most importantly, beyond acknowledging them, 
uh, we take that feedback and we need to action those things. Because what I can tell you is that if we're going to invest in these important conversations, we and every police organization should uh, should be accountable for ensuring that the outcomes are the delivery of better and more equitable policing services and increased trust with the community. So on behalf of our team and our whole uh, organization, 1,200 plus members, I want to thank the BMI team and I want to thank everybody uh, who spent time today. And uh, we look forward to some of these continued conversations. Uh, for certainly. And please uh, look out for the wrap up event that we are planning for you October, um, February the 28th in collaboration with uh, Canadian Caribbean uh, Association of Halting. Um, we will be doing a wrap up for Black History Month, not Black History. Uh, Black History Month, there's a difference. Uh, Black history should definitely be celebrated, educated, talked about 365 days in a year. Um, let me take this moment to thank our awesome, awesome moderators, KD <laughs> and Taiwo. You guys are fantastic, you know. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Lola, Lola, Lola. Guys, 12 midnight, I reached out. I'm like, Lola, save my life. You know, um, this girl is so busy. You can, she wears so many hats, but she just says, sisters, I got you. Thank you, Lala. And uh, my brave, brave, courageous son. Guys, aren't you proud of him? Did you hear him speak? Whoa. You know, thank you for representing, you know, the youth, you know, giving them a voice, asking these questions that I know so many of them in the audience will really want answers for. And everybody that asks, asks any question that we did not address, Ryan, please, 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 I'm going to be sending all of these questions to you. And I will really appreciate if you can address it. We will do a newsletter or a blog and we put it in there because I want people to know that we see them, that we heard them because it's what it's all about. Ah, DJ, Erin, thank you. Thank you for showing up. Thank you uh, for being vulnerable and being brave. You know, really appreciate you. And all of you guys, without you, this program, BMI, we'd be nowhere, you know. So thank you for joining us, for staying with us, for your support, for everything, you know. Just so you know, we have a cohort, a winter cohort that is just um, starting. Um, yes, we have 20 mentees already. And so that is full, but we're going to be, uh, bringing forth lots of skill building programs and with our skill building program financial literacy uh, corporate awareness career readiness uh, leadership transformation it is open to everyone right so please look out on our social media pages and sign up and sign up because again that is how change happens until next time I'm really encouraging all of us to go out there and be the change you want to see Thank you, Evangeline. Can we play the last music? Wait.